put on these computers. Okay. Good. Okay. So, yeah. So I, you know, this is an experiment. Um, you know, particularly over the summer, but I thought it would be helpful uh, to build up a little bit of capacity for doing front end work within the CS125 staff to kind of do a little bit of a project sort of side by side. So my plan is to run these sessions periodically, tape them, um, and then again, I'll sort of do a mixture of question answering, some live coding, talk a little bit about, you know, why things work the way they work or whatever, um, with the goal of, this is something that we actually plan on using. So this is a, this is a project that's designed to bring some chat capabilities to our CS125 website. So I would like a way to add chat um, in a variety of places. Uh, we actually have some neat ideas about some integrations for this, but certainly have some places on the site, the new site where you'd be able to join a chat room and maybe ask questions, or we could use this on the help site so that the staff could chat with each other. Um, we also have some neat ideas about how to sort of integrate chat with homework help so that students, um, you'd be able to help a student on a homework problem without getting on a video call. You could actually see their code and then kind of chat along with them about what was going wrong. I think that might improve the efficiency of the people that are working the, the help uh, site because they could actually see students' code and see what they're doing and, and, and offer help that way. Um, but anyway, so what I've given you guys to start with um, is just Sort of, you know, as you build, as you build things, you know, I, I always sort of try to follow pattern. Um, you know, I've this is my, I don't know, third or fourth or fifth little React TypeScript development project, and so I have certain ways that I like to do things, and I've just sort of repeated them from project to project. It's not to say that this is like the perfect right way to set things up, um, but it's the way that's worked. For me in the past and I feel like it's appropriate for this project. So I've given you guys kind of a, a little bit of a, a starting point. I do I do feel like the best thing I can do today is probably just to, to take questions which you guys can let me pull up the chat so I can make sure I can see that. Um, and sort of you know walk people through oh, wow there's some thunder um, walk people through kind of what's happening in the code. Um, and then maybe if we have time towards the end, my plan is for this to go about an hour, then we have some time at the end, maybe we'll uh, take a stab at actually getting something to work. Um, so, like I said, as I go along, please feel free to stop me with chat questions either, you know, over audio or in the chat. Um, but sort of let me, so let's walk through what's there. So the, you know, the, as I pointed out in the, on the forum, the, you know, sometimes when we think about client server paradigms when we're building, um, web-based systems, but really in, in a lot of modern web systems, there's actually three different parts. There's the code that's running on the client. There is the, um, there's the thing that sent the code to the client, right? Which I was calling the web server. And then there's this third server that is the thing that the client side code is actually communicating with. Um, you know, some people call this sort of a microservice model or whatever. Um, so for example, when you go to the, you know, Kotlin website, right? In fact, I can, I can show you guys this, assuming it's not down. Um, when you go to the Kotlin website, there's several different connections. There, there is a site that serves you this page, but there's several different connections that your client opens to different microservers that hopefully are still running, maybe not, um, but are doing things like, you know, compiling and running your Java code, maybe not right now, um, saving the contents of editor windows and stuff like that. So this is, so there's, you know, there's the web server that sent you the actual code that's running in the browser, but your, there's code running in your browser that, that is now in contact with several other, um, several other servers, one of which seems to be down right now. Okay, I'll have to fix that later. I had this happen last week where all of our G servers went down, so clearly there's something, something I need to say. Um, Anyway, so so the, the the repository here reflects that. So there's really um, you know there are there are three uh, different places where we're going to be working as we develop. Um, there is the actual uh, component that renders something to the display, um, and this is something that we'll look at kind of first in a minute. Um, that's actually sent to your browser by 
uh, in this case, a um, web server running a framework called Gatsby that allows us to do sort of React first um, web development. Um, there's a second component, which is the client side library for our tool. Um, and that sort of lives in this client directory. And again, I think the, the right way to think about this is this is not intended to render any HTML. This is intended to sort of as a library that our presentational component can use. Uh, so this is going to do things like set up the connection to the server, um, you know, manage that connection, manage some state and information about the different rooms that the user is a part of or whatever, right? So the goal here is to kind of try to make the actual presentational component as easy to use as possible uh, by sort of refactoring as much common functionality as possible at this one point. And then we have a server. So this is actually server-side code that'll run, you know, somewhere on our CS125 cloud somewhere. Um, and this is, you know, the server is responsible for, in, in this particular application, kind of moving data between clients. So you can think at a high level, um, a chat application consists of different front ends that can send each other messages. So the way they do that is they send the messages through this backend server. So they're going to send a message to the server. The server's job is to figure out what other clients do I need to distribute that message to? Um, and the server is also in charge of doing other things like, you know, doing access control. Is a particular client allowed to send a message to this particular room or not? Things like that. But for, but for now, we're going to keep this pretty simple. We'll, we'll get there eventually. The, um, the, the tools that we're using here, so, you know, I, I, you know, for this to work, I think it's best for you guys to kind of hack along with, with, with me. The, VS Code is the IDE of choice for this type of project. I really wouldn't recommend trying to use anything else. TypeScript is a Microsoft project. VS Code is a Microsoft project. The integration between the two is, is quite good. Um, so, you know, I use IntelliJ for a lot of things, but I use VS Code for all of my TypeScript and, and React projects. Um, the, the, the language that we're using is something called TypeScript. So, you know, just a small bit of backstory here about what is TypeScript and, and why do people use it. So, um, the, 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 your web browser runs code in a language called JavaScript. You can, you know, some of you have done this in the past. You know, you can open up, um, one of the things you guys will get familiar with is the website inspector. You can open up this Chrome website inspector and actually run code, right? Uh, you know, I have something that's equivalent to printf. Right, this is actually a, you know, it's sort of like a Python command line interpreter, right? Like I have a little REPL here that I can use to run code. The language that this code is written is a language called JavaScript. JavaScript has a long and fascinating history that goes way back to some of the first web browsers that were actually being developed at, at the University of Illinois or more specifically at the NCSA decades ago. But JavaScript as a language is untyped. So those of you who are familiar with Python, it's very much like Python in the sense that, you know, it has, internally it has the idea of different types, but to a programmer, you're not required to provide information about the type of data uh, that a particular variable contains or things like this as, as you work. Um, and it turns out that, you know, after 20 years of doing this, I can, I can say for certain that not having type information is awful. It makes it really, really difficult to develop in a confident way. Um, and this is true not just of your code, which could always be wrong or do something weird, but it also affects your tooling. So for example, your IDE doesn't know how to auto-complete various things because it doesn't know what the thing is that you're using, right? Like I'm trying to call a method on an object and it doesn't know what the shape of the data is and so it can't make any suggestions about what you might be trying to do, right? I don't know when TypeScript originated, but TypeScript is a Microsoft project that essentially builds a type system on top of JavaScript. So TypeScript is a um, sometimes known as a gradual typing system. Uh, if you think about it, the underlying language that we're using in JavaScript is an untyped. TypeScript brings types on top of it. Now, if you want to use TypeScript, you can use as little of it as you want. You can use just a bit of types here and there. I typically configure my TypeScript project to be quite strict and require that I type everything 
because again, that's usually what you want. You usually want the language to force you to provide information about the status of your business. TypeScript um, is pretty mature at this point, and one of the things that makes it very usable is that lots and lots and lots of existing JavaScript packages have type information provided for them. You might think, well, you know, somebody wrote some JavaScript one day and they didn't provide this type information, so where does it come from? So there's actually a big project called Definitely Type that maintains type information for all of these really common JavaScript libraries. And so usually you don't, if you're using a widely used JavaScript library, you don't need to um, start from scratch and write type definitions for stuff. You can just use the ones that somebody already put out there, right? So that's that's pretty convenient. Um, how do you, how do you those, sorry? How do you yeah, get those? How do you get those like predefined types from? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll show, I'll show, I'll show you. Um, okay, great question. So so let's so also some of you may may be unfamiliar with Node and the NPM ecosystem. So this is a Node project. Uh, in a Node project, a lot of the the pack package.json is sort of the equivalent of like a make file combined with, well, a better way to think about it for those of you that are familiar with, with Java is it's sort of like build.gradle. This contains information about how to, different things you can do with the project. Uh, it contains build information, but also contains dependency information. Um, and so for this project, for example, you can see that we've listed, this is a, it's just JSON. Right, everything in here you can see there's metadata about the project, like the name, description, licensing information. Um, I'll talk about what these are in a minute. Scripts are ways to, um, if you get tired of repeating the same command over and over again, particularly when the command is long and complex, you can essentially just add a script here that will cause NPM to do a particular thing on your behalf. Um, but down here you'll see a couple of different dependency blocks. And so the dependencies that are here represent the things that our project is already using. Um, so for example, we're using Toa as a backend web framework. For, for this particular project, um, I'm actually, the, the, the project repository contains both the client and the server side code. So that's actually a mixture of dependencies here. Some of these are used on the server, some are used on the client. Um, down here, to answer Davis's question, all of these packages that you see under the dev dependencies, so, this distinguished, MPM distinguishes between dependencies that are actually used by your code as it runs and things that you need to develop. And, you know, that distinction isn't always super important, but one way to think about it is if you're only going to use that package during development, that it should probably be down here. All of these packages that start with at types, of which you can see there are quite a few, are per part of this definitely typed project. So one of the things that, that you'll see in the future when we add a new package, um, VS Code will actually suggest that we try and find the type definitions for it. You can see there's kind of a standard format here. So for example, the type, de the type definitions for the, the base COA web backend package are in at type slash COA, right? Uh, COA body parser, you know, you basically have prepend at type slash to the name of the package. A lot of times that's where you'll find them. Um, sometimes the name is a little bit different. Sometimes the types come along with the package itself, so you don't have to install a separate type package. And sometimes you run into packages that don't have type definitions. And in that case, you have some options about what to do. I don't know if we'll run into that yet or not, or, or ever, uh, but it's pretty easy to basically work around that situation, right? Now, again, you don't get to work around it by having types. You get to work around it by getting TypeScript to stop complaining about it. If you want to write a type definition for the package, you could do that. Um, that's, you know, I, I've done that some, for some of our own packages and it's pretty tedious, but, um, but yeah, so, so that's, that's where these packages come from. Okay, so let's go back. So some of you that, are, are, that have looked at JavaScript before uh, may, may notice some things about, about the code we're going to start looking at, and in particular, like type information, right? So for example, this is type information right here. Uh, this interface um, definition. This is essentially describing the shape of data that's going to be passed to our front end chat box component when it's created. And uh, this is, you know, the syntax indicates that um, this component expects to get two pieces of information in its properties, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, one of them is a room. And what I've done just for the sake of sanity uh, is that I've 
basically defined a type alias so that a room ID here is a string. Um, but this will help us keep things a little bit uh, clearer, right? So essentially, our chat component is going to distribute messages based around this idea of a room. Um, so when I create a chat component on the page, I'm going to have to tell it what room should this chat component participate in. It's going, to it's going to send that room information to the server when it subscribes to messages, and then the server is going to say, okay, when somebody sends a message in this room, I know to send it to this particular client. The other thing that I'm allowing to be passed to this component is something called uh, some style properties. These are basically extra CSS properties uh, so that I can adjust the styling of this component on a per, per instance basis. All right, so now let's, let's look at an actual um, piece of, so there's, there's a lot to explain. I'm not sure that I'm, I'm doing this in a, in, a, in a completely perfect fashion, but we have to start somewhere. So um, the place I want to start is actually looking at uh, the front end component that, that, that we're using. Um, so, you know, again, there's just, there's a lot to explain. There's a lot, a lot, of, a lot of neat ideas. So, so this is React. Uh, React is a framework many of you are, have probably heard about. Uh, React is a, a very well-known project in the sort of web development space. It's a, it came out of Facebook. Um, and, you know, roughly, sort of briefly, compactly speaking, the goal behind React is if you think about how web development, uh, some of you that have done web development, uh, works in a more traditional setting, you have these three pieces of information. You have your HTML, you have your CSS, those two together describe how the page is going to look, and then you have JavaScript. And the problem is that the separation of concerns into these three different um, sources of information doesn't always really work out in the sense that you have stuff scattered all over the place. So those of you that have done Android development have experienced this as well. So this is sort of like the divide between your XML files that describe the layout of the app and your Java code. So for example, in your, your Java code, when somebody presses a button, you might want your Java code to do something, right? Or if you're doing web front end, when someone clicks a button on your website, you want some JavaScript code to run. Well, now I've got to make changes in two places. I've got to change my HTML and I've got to change my JavaScript, which are in separate files. And this quickly becomes very, very difficult to reason about. Um, and so, the goal behind React was to say, hey, let's try to bring everything into one place so that I have one piece of code. This is basically JavaScript with some little you know, extra bits in it. Um, Facebook actually created an extension to JavaScript called JSX to do this, um, which you'll see in a second, see some features of it in a second. So but the idea is to kind of try to allow us to bring everything that a particular part of our website needs to operate into one place that's called a component. So a component, so you know, again, what does a component look like? So I've got a development environment right, running right here. This little box corresponds to the code in here, corresponds to the presentation that you're seeing here. Um, and let me get this to go away, okay. In, in this box on the screen. I've actually got two of these side by side. Um, so the, the code that we're going to be looking at for the next few minutes not only controls how this behaves, but it also controls how it looks. It's going to output HTML. This is, you know, sometimes referred to in React as a presentational component. It actually renders HTML. Um, so when we look down here, the return, so, so first of all, this is a function. We'll come back and talk about this in a minute. Um, this is a function. This is the type definition for my function, which says that this is a, React functional component, and it describes the shape of the data that this component expects to receive when you create it. And again, we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. We'll talk about what that means in a sec. This here is just imperative code, and we'll go through some of this together so you guys start, can start to understand it. Um, but when we get to the bottom, you'll see that what my, my code is returning is you can see stuff that looks like HTML in here. And this is, if, again, if you've written JavaScript, you can't normally do this in JavaScript, but in this new extension that Facebook created called JSX, I can actually mix in HTML literals, HTML uh, markup inside my JavaScript code. And you can actually, you know, this is all up here is just kind of pure, most of this is basically pure 
TypeScript. But down here, you can see that I start off with a div tag. Um, there's some differences here, which we'll, we'll point out in a minute, but I've actually got a bit of code inside my, my div, right? So essentially what this does is this, um, this map takes all the messages that my component has sent so far, as you can see, as I'm typing, I'm adding messages to this, uh, this list, and it renders them uh, one after another. Down here, this last piece is rendering this text field. You can see that, uh, you know, now, now one of the things that, you know, you normally want when you're working on a project like this is you want a development environment that allows you to, to, to make changes quickly. Um, the, one of the nice things about Gatsby is it sets up what's called sort of a hot reloading environment for us to use, which allows us to make changes to things and see those changes reflected fairly quickly. So let's, let's just experiment with this a little bit. Let's say that we want to change the placeholder of this text message, this box to something else. You can see, you know, a couple of seconds later, there it is. The other thing that Gatsby is doing is it's preserving the state of our component. So you'll see that we didn't lose all of these messages, messages, quote unquote, that we sent. Um, they're still displayed, right? So I can make changes to the way things look, like let's change our, let's get rid of this. Well, you know what? Actually, I actually want to make some change. Let's put some padding inside this so that it sets it off a little bit from the outside. Okay, that looks a lot better. Actually. Um, and then maybe we'll take this black border and we'll make it uh, slightly less awful. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so, so again, this is, you know, this is, the kind of workflow that we want to be in, particularly when we're building front-end presentational components, right? We want to see what we're going to do. We, we don't have time to like compile stuff and have a long build process. We want to be able to tweak things and immediately kind of see the result. All right, so this particular React component is is written in in what's using what's called a functional style, right? Originally, React components corresponded to actual JavaScript classes. And for some of you, that probably made a lot more sense, uh, or would make a lot more sense. Now, um, you know, in, in newer versions of React, they support this idea of a functional component, meaning that I can create a React component that's a function. Um, this is a function. You can see that these are parameters that it's receiving, and then this block indicates the function body. Um, and again, um, there's a return <clears throat> statement down there. Yeah. Quick question about that. Like, the purpose of a functional component is like, or I guess the difference is if you have a JavaScript class, then that can like hold state, right? But ah, uh, so 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 like it a, turns a functional out essentially, sorry, yeah. yeah. So it turns out at this point, there's really no difference from a functionality perspective between the two. Okay, so we're we're oh. we're gonna see how this works in a minute. So so Davis's question is, you know, and and let me hold on a sec. Let me see if I can get a, an example of a functional component, just so you guys can see what the difference looks like. I know I've got some left lying around. I think, I think it's here. Yeah. Um, so this, this is a functional, this is, this is an example of a class-based React component. Um, so this is actually using class, uh, modern JavaScript class syntax. Um, and this, for those of you that are familiar with Java and object-based languages, this might look sort of familiar. This is a constructor, right? It actually uses the keyword constructor. Uh, I've got different functions here that I can define. So it's called component did mount, component did update. Um, this render function is what's actually called to, to render the HTML. This is not a presentational component. This is a context provider, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So this doesn't actually output any HTML. Um, yeah, so, so there's really no, difference at this point between these two styles um, in terms of what you what type of functionality you can provide. Um, the difference is in terms of how we reason about how the component works and, and in terms of the code itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, so for example, you know, and, 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 and again, there is, I am aware of the fact that this particular style of, of working with React is something that's going to cause some of your brains to hurt because you guys, particularly those of you that haven't worked in JavaScript before, don't really understand how JavaScript's functional model works, right? JavaScript functions are much more powerful than the functions that you guys are used to working with in uh, C++ and, and Java and stuff like that. Uh, they can hold state, they can do all sorts of interesting things. 
Um, so, so, so here's, so, but let's talk a little bit about how these functional components work. The, the goal of what kind of the contract that React provides with you as a developer is the idea is that React is supposed to make it easy to update certain parts of the page when certain things change, right? The whole name of the framework is designed around building components, building a little piece of the page, a little box, a little widget that reacts to things that you can do to it, right? Um, so the idea is that, you know, there's a change caused by a button click or user entry or whatever, and we want to update the page, but we don't want to necessarily update the whole page. We may just want to update one little part of it. And this is one of the things that's cool about React is that the framework is doing a lot of work on your behalf when a certain event happens to figure out what part of the page needs to be changed and to only update that part of the page. And it allows you as a developer to think very locally about how you're building web applications. You don't have to worry about what the rest of the page is doing. You just focus on this one little piece that you are, you know, that you're developing. So in this case, our one little piece is rendering this box okay um, if you look here this div right here corresponds to this outer box that has a border on it this list of divs corresponds to these messages that are here each one of them is a, is a separate chunk and then down at the bottom um, this is this text field corresponds to this uh, chunk so you can kind of see where each part of our component is coming from. Now the question is, you know, for example, why are there these messages displayed, right? How is the, how is our uh, component actually reacting to change? All right, so the first thing I want to do is for fun, is I want to put some logging into the component itself, right? Um, so I'm going to put a little log message. This is the um, equivalent of I can attach it. This is equivalent of, of system.out.println or println in, in, in Kotlin or Java, right? I'm going to stick this in here. Um, we're going to see that my uh, page is going to reload. And now let's see how often that thing is. Okay. So notice that every single time I type a key, I see output from my log message. You can see they're sort of building up down here uh, that this number indicates the number of sort of uh, repeats in a row. Every single time I update this, the component is re-rendered. Okay, so this function is being run over and over and over again. Um, and the question is why, right? What is causing this to happen? React as a framework tries to avoid re-rendering a component unless when it, it, it actually has to. So let's look through and try to figure out what's going on. Here. So the, the the first place that uh, we need to look. Um, is we need to think about what state this component is actually maintaining. So React components have two explicit dependencies. One is they have a dependency on the props that they were created with. And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll try to understand what that means in a minute. The second one is they're allowed to declare and maintain state. And that's super important, right? I mean, state is, in this case, the state of the component is the messages that are shown in the chat box window. So a component that this chat box component wouldn't be very interesting without state. Um, this, when you're using a functional component, this is the way that you indicate to React that you want to use a particular type of state. So, and actually for now, let's focus on this. We'll come back to the messages state. But for now, I want to, I'm going to look at this piece of state, okay? Um, this is, so, so this part here after the use state call, this is TypeScript. We are, TypeScript is requiring that we tell it what kind of state is going to be stored here. I'm not sure that we need that because I think TypeScript does actually do pretty good type inference. So TypeScript can tell because this is a string, because I'm initializing my state to an empty string, that that's the kind of thing that this is going to do. Use state returns two things in a list. And this is very canonical React code. You see this all over the place. It returns the current value of the state. And it returns a function that allows us to update that value. Anytime a component's state changes, React will re-render it. Okay, so this is a way that you could update the 
the information that your component is displaying to the world. So when you start building your own React components, you have to think about, let's say the user clicks a button. If you want the component to re-render, to display new output, you have to have some state that gets updated by that action, okay? In our case, let's, let's, so let's take a look at, uh, so I'm just actually gonna log this particular state variable called input. Um, so now if this runs again, right? So you'll see the state that the component is maintaining is actually the contents of the, uh, the text box, right? That allows me to type new messages. So every single time that this component, uh, the state changes, this, uh, these contents are being updated. Um, you'll also see down here that the text field that I'm rendering has its value set by this state. So, so now, now the question is, what's actually changing, right? How is this actually being modified? Um, and so here, you know, when we look at state, we say here's the current value, and then here's a function. This is a function that allows us to update the state. Where is this actually being called? So it turns out it's being called in this, in this uh, keyboard event handler, okay? Um, I, I will admit that this is what, you know, I've, I've been trying to keep things simple, but this is one of the places where there's a little bit of complexity. And the reason for this is that I wanted, I decided to be a little bit fancy and I wanted to allow people to insert a new line in their messages, okay? So that requires that we distinguish between enter, which I want to use to send a message, and control enter, which I'm going to allow you people to use to create a new line. So you'll see here that uh, when I hit enter, the message goes into the list of messages. If I hit control enter, then I get a new line. Um, and it doesn't look like that line break is preserved properly when we add it to our messages, but that's something that we, we, we can fix. Um, so this component down here is something that's provided by the material UI framework, but you can think of this as basically an input. And what I've done is I've told, uh, I've told, uh, I've configured this so that anytime somebody presses a key, this function gets run, okay? So this use callback function essentially, so remember that every time a state value changes, this function gets called. But there are certain uh, things that we don't want to create every time the function gets called. In this case, this callback does not need to be recreated every time the component is re-rendered. So this hook in React allows us to create a function callback that is only updated in cer under certain conditions. And again, what we'll talk about later. But for now, essentially what you can think about is this function gets called every time the, there's an on key down event within this text field. So on key down represents exactly what you think, right? It means somebody pushed the key down. Um, there's also an on key up event that you could handle if you want. And I think it's like an on key press or something like that. But in this case, it's not wrong. So essentially what, what we're doing here is we're saying if they hit enter, and the control key was not pressed, then we actually have a message that we need to do something with. So at this point, again, we'll come back and we'll go through some of this code in more detail. Um, for now, all we're doing is we're adding that messages to this list of messages that, uh, that our component is maintaining, and we're setting our input to be blank. So this clears, has the effect of clearing the input. Otherwise, if they hit control enter, um, all we do is we uh, set the input to be the, whatever the current input is plus, plus a new line. We add a new line to, it, to the input. So this is the place where the logic that, that we create the logic for actually um, updating, sending a message, right? This is where we figure out what triggers uh, an actual message being sent. The other callback that we register is on change. On change gets called every time the value of this particular input box changes. And here, we just set our input to whatever the current value is. So this, so, so essentially every time I type a key, two things are happening. The first one is I'm checking to see if it's the enter key, in which case I should clear the input and send a message. 
Um, and I'm also checking here to see if it's the control enter key, in which case I should just add a new line. And the on change handler is also running and it is updating the input um, state value for my component. So that's what actually any one of these calls, so this set input, this set input, or this set input will cause the component to re-render. And that's what causes this function to run again and causes the uh, this bit to be updated with the new input. Okay. Question. Uh, so the component is re-rendering because it like so re does React keep track of like internal states of components and once the state changes from one to another, it re automatically re-renders that component or something. So my understanding is that it's essentially a call to this function that will cause the component to be re rendered. So, okay. So a call to that function causes yeah. the component to be rendered. Okay. Yeah. Anytime I call set input, um, I don't know if, if React tracks things more internally. I don't know if I call set input and I set it to the same value. I, I suspect that it will re-render the component anyway. Okay. Right? One of the things to understand about React behind the scenes is that React is, is doing something called maintaining a, a virtual DOM. It's mm -hmm. a fancy term. What it means essentially is that here's what happens. So you've got the page that's actually being shown to the user. This is HTML that's loaded into the browser memory. Right. React has its own copy of the page sitting somewhere else that's not being displayed. When you update a component, React takes the HTML that you return and it compares it with what's on the screen. If the, nothing has changed, then it doesn't update the, the display. Okay. Right? This is a performance optimization, right? It basically means if you make some change that doesn't affect what the user is looking at, I have, don't have any work to do, right? Um, and it, my understanding is it actually does this across large trees. So for example, I might have a component that's the parent of a bunch of other components that updates but a lot of the internal components don't update. And so React mm -hmm. doesn't bother to update the HTML. So, you know, one of the things that React is doing is it's trying to make as few changes to the page as possible while still preserving the contract that it has with people that write components, right? You change the state, I update the component. Nice. Um, yeah, but I, I think it's basically these set input calls uh, that, that cause this to happen. When, when you're working inside a React component, that is like the only thing that you can rely on to update the state. So to cause your component to rewrite, sorry. If you do something that doesn't ca cause set some type of state modifying call to be made, your component will not update. Um, so, so why and, do you, and, and, uh, what's that? Why do you have set input then instead of just calling like resetting input manually? Oh yeah, so this is a great question, right? So the question is, why can't I just modify input directly? Um, the answer, my understanding is the answer is because React can't tell, right? If I just change input, React doesn't know that input is different, right? And so it can't re-render re the component. When you call set input, React knows that you've modified state, right? And so basically, whenever I call, so when I'm down here and I call set input to the blank string, this does two things. It changes the value of input, but it also tells React this component is dirty and needs to be re-rendered. Does that make sense? So I could do this, but, but this is, well, I, maybe I can do this. We'll see if I can get away. But this is actually, yeah, so, so VS code is, smart enough <laughs> to tell me that this is not okay um, uh, because this is actually not going to do what I think it's going to do. Um, so I, I, you can never, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a strange, it's a strange thing, right? Um, I mean, I guess the, the, the best way I can think about this is to, to try to create an analogy that, that might sort of connect with a few of you is that is this is sort of like a setter for this, for this value. Um, it doesn't just change the value, it also runs code inside React um, that, that causes, so when I call set input, again, there's two things that happen. The first thing is the value of input changes. And the second thing is React then reruns this entire function, takes the output and updates the display if it needs to. That's a great question.
This is a slightly different format of if you pass a function, this is a function in JavaScript. JavaScript's awesome. This is such a it's such an, an, an elegant little language anyway. So this is a function that takes a single parameter and just appends a new line to it. Um, this is another way of writing set input. You can basically provide an update function that takes a single parameter and returns the new value. Um, there, there's a reason that I did it this way that I won't get into. It's a great question. All right. So actually triggers other, the set question. input call on line 71 or 70. Uh -huh. What actually causes yeah. that to run? So anytime the value in this box changes, right? The value is what's actually being displayed here, right? Um, so, so actually, this is a great point. So I think it's a little confusing because there's both on key down and on change, right? Um, on change gets called every time the value in the box changes. Uh, on key down gets called, I think, before on change. And actually, let's, let's find out, right? Let's put some logging in here. I think and we can actually. It's just in case, like a user does, like a copy paste or something, where they're not pushing a key down, but they still change the input. Yeah, that that I think that would happen. Um, but but really, here the trick is to be able to react differently to particular keys, right? Okay. Um, oh, because if the control keys press and stuff like well, that. Well, right? when whenever enter is pressed, I want to to do something right mm. different. Um, and so let's 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 instrument these and see how it works. Uh, okay, so yeah, so on key down gets so 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 on key down runs first, and then on change runs. Um, what, uh, so so actually, um, you know, I remember why this is this way. This, this is a great question, Daniel. Um, the reason is I couldn't figure out a way to get the whole value in on key down. On key down only can access the specific key that was entered. It doesn't know what the entire contents of the box are, right? On change, you'll see actually has access to the entire string, right? So, you know, on some level, on key down allows you to react to a particular key being pressed, whereas on change gets run every time and provide, it passes you the entire value, right? Um, so does, does that make more sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, great question. Okay. Um, now, one thing you'll notice. So, actually, let's let's just let's just have some more fun with this, right? So, typically, when I'm just typing keys, I see both being run. But see, when I hit enter, on change is not run, right? The reason for this is this down here. So, this I, I don't want to get too much into this. This has to do with JavaScript event propagation model. So, essentially, on key down is the first event that happens. Um, this call down here essentially prevents the, this is a way in JavaScript of kind of saying like, I've handled this event and I don't want anybody else to know about it, right? So I don't want on change to be triggered when I hit enter because I've just cleared the input and I don't, you know, I just basically don't need to run it, right? So in that one case, and I think, let's see here, I think this will also be true, yeah, if I hit control enter, you can see as well that on change does not get run. Uh, and that's because whenever I have an enter key, um, I'm, I'm preventing the, the event from continuing. A anyway, like I said, I, I don't want to go too deep down this rabbit hole, um, but, but this is, this is why. All right. Okay, other questions? All right, so, so now let's, let's look at the next place where the state actually, so this, this component so far has two pieces of state. It has the input and it has a list of messages that it's displaying in this box, right? Um, so this will scroll um, every time I enter, I put, I'm putting things, again, the new lines aren't being rendered properly, we'll fix that at some point. Um, but, you know, I have the scrolling bit where the messages are going upwards. Um, and so that is also a second piece of state on this component, and that's being declared up here. This is a little bit more complex than our previous piece of state because it's actually, it's, a, it's an array. It's an array of a particular type of object. Okay, so, so now we're gonna, talk a little bit about how we use types in this particular system. So 
we need to, the, the place we need to go is over here into this types directory. So any, any client server system, um, one of the things that's important is for the client and the server to agree on what's known as a wire protocol. A wire protocol is the type of messages that are going to be sent back and forth and what they mean. Like what should the server do when it receives a particular type of message? And as we go on with this project, we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about that and adding new messages as, as needed. However, in, in this particular system, there's a pretty clear need. This is an actual chat system, right? So we actually need a chat message, right? Um, and I, so I've created the beginning of a type for this. Uh, let me save this guy. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, just about what this is, okay? Um, so TypeScript is a compile time type system. When you compile your JavaScript code, and that's basically what happens, sometimes we use the word transpile in JavaScript because when you compile JavaScript, you're compiling JavaScript to other JavaScript. You're not compiling, like when you compile Java, you're compiling it to bytecode, right? Um, that's a completely different representation. When you compile JavaScript, you're compiling to, when you compile TypeScript, you're compiling to JavaScript. Um, there's actually, you may be surprised to, to find this out, there's actually a huge amount of translation that goes on within the JavaScript ecosystem. And the main reason is that you have these stupid older browsers that don't support new features. And so when you write modern JavaScript, there are tools that basically will take that and will take all of the cool new things that JavaScript allows you to do in 2020 and rewrite them in these dumb old ways so that like Internet Explorer 5 can still run it, right? Um, sometimes. Um, so, but this happens during this quote unquote, I'm, I'm probably gonna keep using the word compilation. In this case, it's actually true because we're compiling TypeScript to JavaScript, right? Um, but, you know, that's when TypeScript type information is used. So JavaScript fundamentally as a language does not have strong types. And so the type information that TypeScript uses as you're developing is gone when the code actually runs. And this is something that you know you sort of have to wrap your mind around. Um, once your code is running, the types that you were using during development are not present. And so um, if you and so this pre prevents you from doing you know runtime type check. Um, normally within a TypeScript project, this isn't that big of a problem. Uh, because TypeScript is very good about making sure that everything fits together. And so uh, when you, you can think about it as like compilation, but by the time you compile things, you're pretty confident that they work. Um, however, in our case, and in any client server system, we actually have data that's being transmitted across a wire, right? So we're, we have a connection that we're going to establish between the client that runs on the, in the browser and the server. Uh, they're going to exchange data over a WebSocket connection. And across that connection, it's just bytes, right? You can think of it as just sending strings back and forth. And so an important goal of a system like this is for the two sides, again, to agree on the shape of the messages that are gonna be sent. And so for doing this, and again, this is just a personal preference thing. This is something that I've done at previous projects and really like. I use, I'm using a library called RunTypes. This isn't built into JavaScript. It's not a part of TypeScript. This is just a, uh, it's just a library that you can use uh, when, you're, when you're writing node stuff. And run types allows you to do runtime type check. So run types will take a JavaScript object and it will determine whether or not it matches a particular shape. So you tell it this type of object has this type of shape and it gives you, it gives you a TypeScript de definition which we're gonna use uh, for development. It also gives you a, um, a a piece of basically a piece of code that you can use to do things like check to make sure that a particular object actually matches the specification. So this is the type that I've created for our chat messages. And this is something that we'll probably need to adjust as we go along. I put in some things here that I think we're gonna want. Uh, we're gonna wanna know where the message came from. That's the client ID. It's probably gonna be helpful for every message in our system to have a unique ID, which we'll create when we create the message. Um, Messages get set within a room, so we need to know that as well. Um, this, we'll come back and talk about later. This, this is something that I, I have a use case in mind for this, but 
I don't want to talk about it too much right now. This essentially allows uh, the system to distinguish between different types of messages, right? So one type of message might have a certain type of content, but another type of message might have different content. Uh, and then this is actually the message contents themselves. This is a string. So this first bit here is the run type definition. We also want a TypeScript type definition that we can use during development. Now you could write this um, just using typical uh, like types. You can you can create types in TypeScript using you know kind of normal syntax. Uh, I could say type is a I could say type is message. Um, ID is a string, etc. So I could do it this way, right? And basically, when I was done. I'd have something that looks very, very similar to my run types definition. It's a little slightly different. Um, but the nice thing about run types is once I have a run type object, I can just create the TypeScript definition automatically, right? So this TypeScript definition now has the a TypeScript definition that's been generated from my run types object. Um, so essentially, for free, I get two different pieces of typing code. I get a TypeScript. So this is a TypeScript type. It's identified as type. This is not something that's present in our runtime code. It's only present during development and then it's thrown away. Uh, this is not valid JavaScript. Um, this is a runtime object that is available to us at runtime. So we can use this to do things like object validation. Okay. All to say that this, uh, the messages that my component maintains. You know, this is a particular component that's supposed to allow us to chat in a particular room. So what is one piece of state? One piece of state is the message that somebody's about to send. The other piece of state is all the messages that have been sent in the room, right? And I'm using this to, I'm going to eventually use this to correctly render this display so that when people in the room send messages, they get updated, right? So this is an array, there's an array uh, of chitter messages. Um, and I'm initializing it to be empty. Okay, just like when I initialize the state for my input box, I get both a, um, a variable that I use to, when I want to uh, have the state, the, the messages be used in my component, and I get a function that allows me to update that variable. Um, here, my function took a string as an argument. Here, it should take an array as an argument, okay? So you'll, you've noticed that so far, I'm actually, um, I'm able to update one window. Um, and this was something I just did for fun, just to kind of be able to get the UI straight. So when I send, send quote unquote, a message, um, it's updating one chat window, it's not updating both. Our first goal on this project is gonna to get to be the point where these two chat windows that have both joined the same room are kept in sync with each other. So what's happening when I actually submit a message. So keep in mind, submitting a message corresponds to hitting enter and not having the control key down, okay? Um, so here's, here's what I'm doing. This is a JavaScript object declaration. It comes within um, braces. If you guys haven't used JavaScript before, uh, you know, one of the things that's fun about it is how easy it is to create an object. Like there it is, right? So you didn't, I didn't have to define this object because there's no types. Right, it just looks a little bit like JSON. I just get to kind of put anything I want in there. Okay. However, I'm using run types, and before I actually send, eventually, what's going to happen is I'm going to send this message to the server, and the server is going to distribute the message to other clients. And so, as a sanity check, I want to make sure that this message is shaped properly. You're hearing me talk a little bit about object shape, and one of the reasons I'm doing that is to try to start embedding in your brain the fact that JavaScript is a language that's what's called structurally typed. TypeScript is structurally typed. So in Java, there's a the notion of a nominal type, right? When you create a type in Java, you give it a name, right? A Java class has like a unique path, right? Um, in TypeScript, there's no nominal types. Instead, TypeScript will consider two objects to be the same type if they have the same shape. Um, so if two objects have the same fields and those fields have the same types, to TypeScript, they are the same object. Okay, this is sometimes called structural typing, right? 
It's like if I've got two, it's like in Java, if I have two different classes that have the same name field with the same types, those are the same type to TypeScript. To Java, they're not because they'll have two different names. To TypeScript, they're the same, right? Um, so the, the shape of this data is it has a field called type that is the literal message string. It has UUID v4 returns me a unique ID. That's a string that gets assigned to ID. Uh, it has a property called client ID, but for now I'm setting to be the empty string. Um, we'll have to fix this later, but, but there's nothing better to do. I'm using the room property of this uh, component, which we'll come back and talk about in just a sec. I need to get back to talking about props. Um, there's a message type, which I'm setting to text, and then the contents, which should be a string. This function, chitter message call dot check, does two things. First of all, it checks to make sure that whatever I pass in here conforms to this run type type definition. Okay? And then it returns something that has the TypeScript type new message, which is kind of convenient because then I can use it in certain places. So for example, you'll see that I'm setting messages to be new message prepended to whatever was in the uh, messages array at that point. I'm adding this to the front of my array of messages. That's what this call does. Uh, eventually, we're gonna actually need to do something with this like sending right, to the server so that it can be distributed to other clients. For now, we're just putting it in the front of the array. So, you know, to kind of see the value of, of run types, let's, let's break this and let's see what happens. So let's say that I put uh, the wrong type on the message, right? Um, so now let's try, now I get this big boom, right? Uh, when I tried to send the message and I'm gonna get a nice error screen and essentially this is happening because um, I'm trying to, I've told, uh, run types that this particular type of object has a type field that is literally the string message. Okay, this is how you can set a type that has to be a particular value. Um, and I've said it wrong, right? Um, so I can do this. Um, you know, this this actually, you know, there's 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 a lot of common errors that this will catch, right? I'm not going to go through stuff right now, but if I try to put an array in here or a number or something like that, you know, uh, run types is going to help, right? Okay, so so that's that. The last thing I want to do, um, and and you know this might be an, uh, enough for today, is to go uh, to talk a little bit about component props. So what we've been talking about so far is state, right? State is internal information that the component maintains as it runs. Um, typically, the way React components work is that when you interact with them they update their state and then re-render. That's what's been happening. When we type, you know, I, gotta, I think I might have to hard reload this. Yeah, so, okay, so now you can see when I hard reload, that state is cleared and it's gone. But so far, when I add a message, every time I type a key, the state of the component is actually being updated. Right? There's another piece of information that a React component uses to render, and those that's what's called plus, okay? Here, this TypeScript definition is actually describing the type of props that this component is going to receive, okay? Props, and when we created our components down here, this is, we are passing a prop to the component. This is passing a value prop, and we're setting it equal to the value of the input string that the current a component maintains as state, okay? Props are provided to a component by the thing that created it. It's not something that a component modifies. You know, so, so again, properties, right? State changes, properties don't. Um, so one of the properties of my component is room. This indicates the room ID. So you might be wondering, where does this information come from? In order to see that, we actually have to look at the place in our code that's creating a chitterer component. And that's this piece of what's known as MDX. I could have showed you an example of this using like actual React where it was creating a new component, which we could do. Um, MDX is a tool that allows me to mix Markdown, this is Markdown, right, with uh, React. So I can, I can have React components inside my Markdown, which is pretty, pretty nice. So I'm importing my component here from the file that I was just editing. 
And here I am rendering it twice. So the first time I'm rendering it and I'm setting its room prop to be test. And then the second time I'm rendering, I'm setting its room prop to be test and I'm also setting its style prop. And all that is is to give, a, give us a little bit of reading room between these two, otherwise they'd be on top of each other. Okay, so this is what's actually setting the, the, the property for this component. One of the patterns that you'll notice in React a lot is that frequently one component state is the next component's prop, right? So for example, value here, the input, sorry, input here, the input string is a state on my component that I'm updating using callbacks that I've registered on the input button. When I re-register that input field, I'm passing the value as a prop. Um, I'm also passing other props, like I'm using so, so one piece of uh, clarity here about, about JSX that might be uh, confusing if you're coming from working with, uh, with HTML is that class, the CSS class property is called class name in JSX. And that's because class is a reserved word in JavaScript. So they just change it to class name. Um, all of these things here are props. Uh, this is the prop that indicates the kind of uh, filler text that's in the, this indicates that this particular text field can support multi-line input. This is a Boolean prop. So if I set it, it's basically equal to true. If I don't set it, it's, it's false. Um, these are props that, that uh, hold references to functions that I'm registering that get called when certain things happen. So that's the other piece of the puzzle here in React is when does a component re-render? It also re-renders if its props change. So every time somebody pushes a key in my little input box, what's happening? My state's being updated. So I'm, this callback is running. It's calling set input. That's updating my state. This function re-renders, and then it renders the text field again with different props. Um, and that will cause that component to re-render. So if you change the room for this component, it will completely re-render as well, right? So if the props of a component change, it re-renders. JavaScript is smart, sorry, React is smart enough that it doesn't, one thing, important thing to realize is that it doesn't throw away the component and start over if the props change. Typically what happened is the component is allowed to accept new props. So props, you know, state, a component can't change its own props. It does change its own state, but that doesn't mean the props don't change over time. So this is one of the things that I used to think that's, that's just incorrect, right? So for example, every time I change the value prop on the text field, it doesn't mean that I'm creating a completely new text field. Uh, it's like throw out the old one and create a completely new, um, that's, if you're, used to, if, you're, if you're trying to think about these as sort of like objects, that's how you might think about it. You'd be like, well, I have a completely different object because I called the constructor to something different. It's not exactly how it works, right? It turns out that components could actually accept new props in a way that preserves a lot of their existing state and information that they want to, right? Um, that's part of what makes React so efficient, right? So if I had to re-render this text field every time I change the value, that would be pretty wasteful. Um, okay. Um, any, let me pause for any additional questions. I'm trying to find my Zoom thing. Is everybody? Everybody like falling asleep on me or? I uh, just no more questions. Yeah, yeah no okay. questions. Yep. Okay. All right. So let's. What do you guys want to do? Do you guys want to call it quits for the day? Do you want to do? You want to go on for another ten to fifteen minutes? In the interest of time, I'd appreciate calling it a day. I don't know about okay. other people. Okay, that works for me. Um, I'm trying to think of something, uh, some little project I can do. Maybe we're not to that point yet. Maybe what we should do is we'll just meet up again a couple of days um, and keep going. Um, I had I had hoped to get in a little farther, but I'm, I'm comfortable with the pace we went today, but I'm not sure you guys are kind of ready to, 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 to take a stab at this until we look at kind of the, the client and the server components. So why don't... Make sure everyone's development environment is set up, because like I was having trouble 
getting the server running with npm start. Um, I haven't even gotten a chance to start doing that yet. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, so actually, why don't why don't we do this? I'm. Why don't I stick around for a few minutes? Any anyone who wants to leave is welcome to to head out. Um, let me back up a little bit, and I'll just I'll just do some uh, development environment kind of uh, walkthrough, and then um, I'd be happy to try to help people who are having trouble. Um, but but those of you that 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 have something set up and 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 working can can take off, and and we'll we'll meet again. I think I'll try to do this again in the next couple of days, so that you can kind of get to the point where you guys have seen. Uh, the client certain like the, the the client contact provider on the server side code, and then get get on to actually to trying your hand at adding 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 the feature. Um, all right, so development environment. So VS Code is obviously part of that. Um, I typically have three different pieces to it. I have um, a a web browser. Obviously, you're going to need that. Um, and then I'll have VS Code. I know there's ways to like run terminals in VS Code. I typically don't. I'll just typically have a separate terminal down here. Um, uh, sorry the, to interrupt. Is there any recommended version of Node we should use? 16? Uh, yeah, I'll show you in a sec. There's actually, if you look, there's a tool versions file that's checked in. Um, that's the exact version of Node that I'm using. Um, but anything, any any Node 12 should probably work. Like 12 plus, yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, I've, I, 12, 16 is old, so I would get something 12. No, I mean, 12, 12 will probably be fine. I would, I, I would probably guarantee that anything that is newer than this would work unless you switch to a new. Oh, so Node version manager is one option. It, it, for those of you that you are using Unix-like environments, I would strongly su suggest installing ASDS. It is by far the best version manager I've ever used. Um, and it will manage Node, Ruby, Python, everything. Um, it's basically like a version manager manager. Um, and it's it's really nice. Um, one of the, I actually used Node version manager for a long time. And one of the reasons I stopped is because it, 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 it doesn't do a good job of pinning a version to a directory, which is something you usually want to do. Um, but yeah, it, it, for those of you that are on like Mac-like environments, Unix-like environments, I would strongly suggest uh, installing the ASDF. Uh, the tool versions file is actually an ASDF file. So if you have ASDF installed, you can basically really easily install all the versions out of that file uh, for your environment. Um, so, so again, like this will get more complicated as we go. There are, let me talk a little bit about what's going on when, when you actually run a development environment. So for that, let's look at the package.json file. Um, there are there are three things that we need to do when we when we build when we when we develop this project. We need to have the backend server running. Um, even though we haven't done much with the project yet, the front end client is already going to try to connect to the backend server over a WebSocket. I haven't showed you that code yet, but it's there. Um, if, if you want to look at it, it's in the it's in the client directory in the context wrapper. This is a part of what we'll look at next time. Um, the so you need the server running. Um, that's one command. Um, let's see here. Do I have to, do I have to split out? I think I do. Yeah. So if you now when I talked before about these scripts, so basically if you want to if you want to run one of these scripts, some of these have special meaning, but you can also just add ones that do things that you want to happen. Um, most of them require that you prepend them with run. npm start is an exception, so that's kind of a special one. Right? npm start you can run it just by just running npm start. The rest of them you run by running npm run and then whatever command. Right? So for example, here's how we would run the server. So this is just running the server. Um, this is running a tool called nodemon, which will restart the server when we make changes. Um, Part of having the same development environment for a tool like Node, particularly when you're working on several different pieces of it, is you want everything to happen automatically, right? Whenever you change a file, you don't want to have to like restart something, right? You just want it to automatically happen, right? So here we have a tool that is monitoring our server code and will automatically restart the server anytime that code changes. Okay, so that's one piece. Uh, the next thing you need is you need your client library. Um, the, we're using a tool called Rollup to bundle the client code. You can, I don't know what the, uh, JavaScript, the JavaScript ecosystem is fun, right? So this is a tool that essentially is responsible for taking our client side code, 
transpiling it into less modern JavaScript and then also including any libraries that it might need. So we're using a tool called Rollup for that. Um, to run that tool, we do npm run client. This will, you'll see that when it starts, it's building, it actually builds the, the, the library in two different ways. I don't want to get into why, um, but, and then it sits here, it says waiting for changes. And if we make changes to um, the client side code, so let's just, I'll just save this file. Um, I guess it's hard enough to not just rebuild on save. So let's try this. Uh, come on. Yeah, so now you'll see that it's going to rebuild, right? The server side code should do the same thing. Let's go check and make sure. Let me go look at the server side code. Just put the dumb white space in here, and then you see it restarting to change. So, so I have basically tools that will monitor both of these. And then the last thing I need is I actually need the web server that's sending me this page. And you can see this is down right now. So I'm getting all of these angry messages. Um, that is, I can run by running npm run example. So this actually switches into the example directory and runs Gatsby, which builds the example website uh, and then serves it on port 1234. Daniel, what was the problem you were having? Um, let me pull up my terminal and see what it said. So I did the npm i for the installation. Did you do it in the ex in the example directory? Yeah. Um, okay. You did both in the root directory and in the example. Directory. Yeah. So I followed the steps okay. you listed on the page. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then when I ran npm start, it like ran for a little bit and then it gave me an error which is probably easier to just paste in instead of saying it. Uh, yeah, or, or, or screenshot it and put it on the forum. We can look at it there. OK. Um, I'll just do that. It's very easy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which, which version of Node do you have installed? If you do just Node version, what does it print out? One second. I think I have 13, some point something. Okay, I don't know about 13. Uh, Just in the sense that like, node 13 is a major version change from node 12. So I don't know what has changed in node 13 um, and whether or not we would expect things to work on node 13. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it works for me on 14 if there's any help. I don't remember, node is, if I remember correctly, Node has some interesting uh, develop. I, I don't remember what their what their uh, yeah. So basically, like their LTS releases follow this even number pattern. Um, and I have thirteen point eight. If that helps at all. Okay. Yeah, I'll take a look at the message once you post it. And, and, and Do you want me to post it in the work log thread or a separate? PM or something. Yeah, feel free to. Yeah, well, I don't want to be careful what I see on the form. Um, yeah, feel free to post it in the in the work log thread, and I'll I'll, okay. I'll try to I'll try to resolve it. But th these are the three pieces that you need, right? Now, uh, in order to to simplify things, I've put together the, the npm start script, which essentially runs all three at once. You can see them starting up separately. So it's running NodeMon, that's running the server side code. Now it's running the bundler, which is building our client side code. And then this last output is from Gatsby. Uh, the prefix here sort of allows you to tell where our output is coming from. Um, the benefits of this are just as one command and everything starts up in one place. Um, Gatsby in particular is very slow to start. Uh, once you get it going, it's happy and it kind of does the right thing. Um, but it can take a few, I mean, you can see it took, I don't know, 10, 20 seconds to get, to get running. Um, so that's the, that's the bottleneck. Um, when you guys are developing, I mean, typically changes you make will be reflected pretty quickly. There are times when you just have to control C and, and restart. And that's the only way to get things to kind of start to be sane again. Um, so, um, Development environment questions or issues. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at, at, at 
what what Daniel has uh, in a sec. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that one of the things that prop that the people I don't know maybe the science of Python or not. I feel like you know there's there's all this ooing and I know how terrible it is to do things. For example, with like languages like C plus plus, but um, job, I mean, modern JavaScript environments are 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 pretty are, are pretty fragile, right? I mean, I've I've spent a lot of time fighting with mine and, and trying to get them to do certain things that they sometimes want to do and sometimes don't. But there's there's a fair amount of complexity going on here. I'm trying to, you know, uh, paper over some of that uh, so that we can make forward progress. But there's a, there's a fair amount going on under the scenes in terms of different parts of the tool chain that are interacting with each other. So so problems are more common than you. All right, I think I'm gonna head out. Um, I will, uh, Daniel, I'll go check on the forum and, and see if I can run down your problem. And then I'll, I think maybe we'll do this again toward the end of the week. Um, I will, I'll, I'll point you guys at a couple of, of things to look at before we meet next, which is essentially gonna be the, the client side library, which is the context provider that provides the actual chat capabilities that are presentational component it's going to use, and then the actual server side uh, TypeScript that, that is there, right? And next time we sit down, we'll go through those together and, and hopefully get to the point where we actually starting to get this thing to do something, which would be cool. All right, I will uh, see you guys in a few days. Thanks.